I can have your attention, we'll get started. Um, this is our fourth installment of the Business Etiquette Series for the Marketing Club. And uh, today, Renee Dahl is here to talk about interview and office etiquette. So, if you have your attention, I'll just hand it over to you now. Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Good. Good. Now, as much as I love a captive audience, I could talk at you for the next hour straight. I would love it to be a little more interactive. So I encourage you to ask questions. If you don't agree with something I'm saying, tell me about it. Or if you want me to expand on things, I'm more than happy to do so as well. OK? OK? Yes. Yeah, there we go. It is a little intimidating to stand up here in front of you all. So I just want to make sure you're all interacting and laughing at my jokes a little bit. So as I was introduced, I'm Renee Dahl, and I am a recruiter for Fletcher Allen Healthcare, a big hospital across the lake. I've been a recruiter or hiring people 15 years now, since I graduated from SUNY Plattsburgh pretty much in 1996. Um, so I'm hoping that you, oh, Let's see if we can, yeah, let's hope to do that later. Um, so I'm hoping to just give you a little insight and how to best present yourself when you're going to interview. And then once you get that dream job, how to not offend those around you. Sound like a plan? Yep. Great. So I'm sorry. As I was saying, I've been hiring people for 15 years, and I have seen it all. And when I mean all, I mean I've seen it all. So I'll try and share with you some things that I've seen in my time as what not to do. And hope that it helps you out a little bit. So I, th I always like this quote from Bernie here. Outcomes rarely turn on grand gestures or the art of the deal on whether or not you've sent someone a thank you note. It really is the small things that really do add up. Um, and you'll see that when you're out there in the working world. How many of you are seniors getting ready for that handful? Raise them high. Uh, so you're getting ready. I know some of you already have positions. Some of you are just starting to look. And uh, thank you notes are important. We'll get to that. But it really is the continuous um, efforts at making people comfortable in your presence that will make the difference for you. So we'll go over <coughs> interviewing etiquette. That seems to be the area I think that would be the most helpful for you. So you'll see that we'll spend the most time there. We will go over office etiquette. And there definitely will be time at the end for questions. So for the interview, before you have an interview, before you arrive at your interview, I want to ask you to double check everything one last time the day before your interview. And that includes the date, the time, the place, and the people that you are going to meet with. This is pretty huge. Um, you are going to walk into a room full of strangers and you're going to want to know who they are and what their role is in the organization. Most HR people, recruiters, most organizations are more than happy to send you a schedule in advance, but you always just want to double check. I work for an organization that has a number of locations, and human resources is split out in two different locations. I've had a lot of people show up at my office when really their interview was about 20 minutes away. And if they're walking in five minutes before their interview starts, it's unlikely they're going to get where they need to be on time. So you just want to double check the key facts before you go. So first impressions. This is going to be someone's first impression of you when you walk into the room. It really counts, right? Right? So this is very important. Please arrive alone. I know that you may be nervous. You may be in a new city. If someone comes with you, have them wait in the car. Don't bring your dad. Don't bring your mom, your best friend, your boyfriend. You want to show that you're independent and self-assured. And so bringing another individual undermines that a little bit. I have had people bring their dad to the interview and actually sit in on part of it with the benefits just so they knew what their daughter was getting into. She didn't get the job. Early, but not too early. It is important to arrive on time for an interview. I can give you an example. I schedule my interviews pretty strictly throughout a day. I might interview five people in a day. I've got those marked out pretty well. If someone walks in 10 minutes late, chances are they're only going to get 10 minutes of my time to make a decision on whether or not they're going to be a good fit for my organization. It doesn't really reflect well. If you're looking to put out your best foot forward, you want to make sure you get there on time. And when I say early but not too early, five to 10 minutes is the perfect amount of time to arrive at an organization. And the earlier than that, and the recruiter or the hiring manager feels a little pressure to get out there and, and get you, uh, but five to 10 minutes is just perfect. That way you can hang up your coat, you can relax a little bit, calm your nerves, 
the hiring manager will come out and get you and you can start off on the right foot. Well dressed. So this is my personal, um, I guess a peeve is the right thing to call it. Um, when in doubt in an organization, dress up. Um, I've had people show up and so I hire primarily nurses. I also hire a large number of um, entry level registration, patient account services type individuals. And I've had people show up in scrubs, wrinkled khakis, crocs, they used to, you know what crocs are? Those aren't the impression that you want to make. When in doubt, a suit always works really well. I remember one of the first things I bought when I was getting ready to graduate is a very traditional navy blue suit, white pearls, very conservative, very traditional. In most organizations, it's still the right way to go. Know your industry. It might not be the right choice if you're looking to come on board as a video game um, designer. You may not want the navy blue suit, but you will never go wrong dressing up a little bit as opposed to down a little bit. Accessories. So I'm going to deviate for just a moment here because accessories, handbags, cell phones, um, and I'm going to talk about cell phones for just a minute. How many of you have a cell phone? How many of you never go anywhere without your cell phone? I'm going to strongly encourage you to really think about the message your cell phone makes about you. You're going to want to turn it off walking into an interview, not vibrate, just plain off. That's a minute. We all can hear it when the phone vibrates, right? I hear a phone vibrate and I'm immediately like, that's got to be mine. So you can hear it. It's, you'll be tempted to touch it. I know I play with mine all day long. It never leaves my side and it's very distracting. So you don't want to check it for the time. You just want to leave it in the car if at all possible. But while we're on the topic of cell phones, how many of you have one of those rings that rings a song, a popular song? Or when someone else is calling it, it says, please hold while we connect your, make you connect your call and then it plays your favorite song? Any of you? If the uh, song that you have going on there is Baby Got Back, it's not the reflection you want it to be of you. I have actually listened to people's songs and decided from that that they weren't the right fit for the organization, didn't leave a message, hung up the phone, and didn't call back. If I'm hiring someone who needs to be precise, perfect in front of our guests, someone who's made some poor judgment when it comes to the music on their cell phone, at the end of the day, if that's what I have to make a judgment call on, that's what we're going to make a judgment call on. Some of the positions that you're interviewing, you'll be interviewing for are entry-level positions I will post for 24 hours and receive 125 applications. So you want to make sure you're doing everything just right so that I can screen you in as opposed to screen you out. Does that sound a little scary? <laughs> now, I want to make sure I don't, I don't frighten you. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you use etiquette because you want people around you to feel comfortable and enjoy it. You are never going to get everything 100% right in an interview. You're never going to get anything 100% right through a hiring process. Everyone's got their own peeves. But if you're just calm and comfortable and make people around you feel good, that's going to go a long way to helping you get that job. Does that make you feel a little bit better? I still don't do everything perfectly all the time. Believe you me. So the cell phone, you're going to turn it off, right? Leave it in the car? Yes, Renee, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, handbags. <coughs> I would prefer to see a small handbag. You're not going to need a lot of luggage when you're interviewing with me. Even if I keep you the whole day, you're not going to need a ton. So you can just one small bag. If you come in with three bags and your boots and your backpack, it's, that's a lot of baggage for a day, right? So you want to pare it down as little as possible. In introductions, when you introduce yourself, you'll always want to use your first name and your last name and catch the first name, last name, and title, if at all possible, of the people that you meet throughout the day. Again, this can be hard, so you might want to carry a pen and paper with you so you can catch those and the correct spelling you'll, because of something you'll want to do after the interview. The handshake. So, Dr. Church, are you still teaching the gender and management class? No. So one of the most useful tools, there are many useful tools, that I, things that I learned here at Plattsburgh, but one of the most useful things was the handshake. Do you still teach the handshake? Great. How many of you have learned how to give a proper handshake? So some of you, if you have not yet learned, I strongly encourage you to learn how to have, to have a proper handshake. Do you mind if I just use you as a, as a guinea pig? So I know it sounds silly, but go on in, web to web, 
a nice strong handshake. Don't try and break my hand. And don't, I've had people come in like this. That doesn't do a whole lot for me either. Nice firm handshake shows that you're serious, you're interested in the position. Thank you. Um, and really makes a good statement about where you are. Any questions on the handshake? We can practice later if you want. Does that sound like fun? So during the interview, how many of you have been on an interview yet? So a good number of you, right? So how would you prefer to see someone sit? Like this? Or this? Which one says, I'm intrigued and excited about the opportunity? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I used to hire police officers for the city of Burlington. And I always looked to see how alert and present they were. And we used to uh, make them a little uncomfortable by keeping this chair about three feet away from the table. So there'd be three of us, two gentlemen in uniforms, um, and myself. And uh, they'd be, we'd be sitting up against the table, and we'd have one person sitting there. And just to see how we could keep them a little uncomfortable. We just wanted to see how alert they could be, be for the organization for the interview. Know your audience. This is not time to pull out your best joke. Um, you want to steer away from anything political, controversial, anything that might be offensive in any way, shape, or form. I know when I get nervous, I start to babble a little bit. And that's when sometimes you might say th something that you don't mean to. I encourage you to really take a deep breath before you say anything. Um, not a good time to talk about the latest I don't know, the latest controversy in Wisconsin, or your opinions on unions, or your opinions on what, uh, the current president, because you never know who's in the room. Uh, I used to work for the city of Burlington, as I mentioned, and I worked for a very liberal progressive mayor, and some of the people that supported him were very conservative. So it, whenever someone thought they were making a joke, it really wasn't as funny as they thought it was, because they had offended half the people in the room. So just kind of keep that in mind. Don't interrupt. I know when you, uh, have you been practicing your interview questions at, at home? I know one of the things, I do a lot of mock interviews for St. Michael's College across the way, and I always strongly suggest that you take some of the interview questions you're expecting to hear and practice them in the mirror. So you're going to be so ready to answer, views, inter, answer some of these interview questions, like, tell me about your greatest weakness, right? You all have the answer to that one down pat right now? Right, maybe? Uh, that you might want to just jump in and answer, because you just have that one nailed. Don't. You know, just give everyone a minute. Uh, I expect you to take a moment between the time I ask you a question and the time to answer. So you never want to interrupt with, with something you want to make sure I hear. Um, ask intelligent questions. So when you're interviewing for an organization, I love it when you are truly passionate about the place I work. I'm really passionate about the place I work. Go online, check it out. Most organizations have a website. They probably have a Facebook page. They have a Twitter feed. LinkedIn accounts, go to all of those places and take a look and see what you can find out about the organization. If I see that you've done your homework and are really interested, I'm going to be more interested in you. I, for example, I work in a mission-driven organization. Fletcher Allen, we provide health care. We are an outstanding health care organization. We're an academic medical center. Does anyone even know what an academic medical center is? Let me tell you, 10 minutes before my interview, I didn't know either. But I looked it up. And being able to talk intelligently about it when I interviewed for this position really helped make a difference. Lunch and dinner. I'm just going to, I know you guys are, um, next week is it? There's a lunch or there's a dinner uh, etiquette on um, April 7th. And that's, I strongly encourage you all to go to that as well. I could go heck for a fresher, refresher. But um, sometimes I'll take people out for dinner or out for lunch when they're interviewing with me for many positions. I have two recommend, recommendations. Don't order spaghetti and don't order alcohol. There are organizations that they use it kind of as a test to see where your judgment falls. They often will have you order first. Just don't ever do it. Even if somebody else orders alcohol at the table, you want to be on your top of your game. You don't want to let something slide or slip that you don't want to let slip just because you've had one glass too many. Sound fair? After the interview, thank you notes. I think this is the forgotten art. I strongly, strongly encourage you, if you want to stand out from the rest of the people you're, you're um, 
competing with, like I said, 125 applications for a position. Write a thank you note to everyone you interviewed with that afternoon. As soon as you get home, write them, send them out the next morning. Email is perfectly appropriate. However, a handwritten note goes a long way. I actually keep the, the thank you notes I receive. I bet you I have thank you notes from five years ago sitting in my desk somewhere. So you, just, you remember that candidate. And even if you may not be the right candidate for that position, you're like, oh, remember Jane? Yeah, she sent a great thank you note. She was lovely, really wants to be here. Let's give her a call for this other position. So it's really just a differentiator. And in a thank you note, it's very simple. Thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed meeting you and your team. I just wanted to reiterate my interest in the position and, this, and what I think I can bring to the organization. Something small, something simple. You don't need to stress out about it. Sign your name, there you go. Have any of you ever sent thank you notes after an interview? Good handful, like I said it is, it is a forgotten art, but it's a, it really goes far. It really is a good differentiator for you. Appropriate follow-up. So this is my, this is another area that I feel strongly about. I think it's totally okay to follow up with a recruiter at the end of the interview process. If someone, if you were given a timeline, thank you very much for coming in. You can expect to hear from us in a week. And you haven't heard from us in a week and one day, go ahead, give a call. It's all about a matter of um, being polite and being helpful. Um, I would not encourage you, and I know Dr. Church spoke about social media uh, a couple of, a few days ago. I've had individuals after interviewing them try to friend me on Facebook. I would not say that's a great choice. Um, LinkedIn, have, are any of you on LinkedIn? A couple? I strongly encourage you to, to take a look at LinkedIn and consider having a profile there. I would accept a LinkedIn connection from someone I had interviewed. I think that's a, it's kind of a professional. Are you familiar with LinkedIn at all? No? All right, I'll give you a two minute primer. LinkedIn is, is a professional version of Facebook, essentially. Uh, professionals are on there. You can add a photo, you can add your title and your work experience, kind of an online resume, and have your areas of specialty. You then connect to people that you know professionally or personally. There are also groups um, where you can join. One of the groups I belong to is the Association of Healthcare Recruiters, National Association of Healthcare Recruiters. In those groups, there are dialogues, there are job postings. It's a great place to look for positions. And it also adds a certain level. You can check out people by company. For example, I have about 300 connections. So when I'm looking for someone with a particular skill set, LinkedIn is actually the first place I go. I do a little search, see if anybody has the title of, the, of the, what I'm looking for. I go into the groups that I belong to and see if they have any matches. <coughs> and I reach out to people through that way. So I do encourage you to be on there. And like I said, I, I would connect with someone I had interviewed on LinkedIn not necessarily Facebook. Facebook is more my um, casual, more my casual self. But uh, while I think it's great to follow up, you, you want to be careful, you want to follow up in a timely manner. One thing I do want to tell you all is that most recruiters do have uh, caller ID. So I have the saying, of, I actually get paid to answer the phone. I'm excited to answer the phone and talk to people, but if I see someone dialing my number 15 times in the span of an hour, I'm far less likely to answer it. So you just want to be cognizant that we're probably going to know, we're going to recognize the number. Just something to think about. But uh, any questions on follow-up, like when you should, when you shouldn't? Yeah. Is there a time limit? Is there too late to respond? Too late for you to respond? No. Nope, until you've received a letter saying that the position's been filled. And that's an etiquette on a recruiter's end. So as, while you're interviewing, you're also interviewing the organization. And the interview process will tell you a lot about the organization and the amount of respect that they have for their employees, too. So you are just as much in the driver's seat as the, as the hiring manager is. Um, you should always receive some kind of communication from the organization saying where you are in the process. The hiring manager or the recruiter, whoever you call, should never be um, unprofessional on the phone. It just does give you a uh, good insight as to what the organization is like. But until you receive a letter or a call or an email saying the position's been filled, it is totally appropriate to follow up. I'd say once a week, once every couple weeks is appropriate. Does that sound fair? Any questions on that part? So silver medalists and burning bridges. So in my 
organization, we refer to silver medalists as really great candidates that weren't the right person for this particular position at a time. So we do try and stay in touch with them. We do consider them for other opportunities. And so it's always important to never burn your bridges. Um, I have had the unfortunate experience in the past of not selecting someone and have them unleash um, a little bit of their frustration on me. And the job search is definitely, a, can be one of the most frustrating experiences of your life, but you never want to burn that bridge. I am. Um, to share an experience I had a number of years ago, probably 12 years ago, 11 years ago, I was hiring for a receptionist for my HR department, for the organization I worked for. Um, the title was HR Administrator, so it sounded like it could be a higher level position, but really it was receptionist, and if you read the job description you saw that. I had an individual who had been a VP of HR apply for my position. He didn't receive the position because it wasn't the right match for his skill set. Um, and I encountered him actually at the Department of Labor when I was presenting there and he shared with me his frustration in what would be in a less than ideal way um, to the point that I was uncomfortable, I was embarrassed, I was upset uh, and it was in front of a large group of people. That was 10 years ago. I can still tell you his name today and he applied for a position with my organization maybe six months ago. I gave him to my manager to hire an inter interview. I said, you know what, I'm not comfortable. This is the situation I had with him. 10 plus years ago, I don't think he's the right fit, but I don't want to hold this against him. He didn't get the job either. That's a pretty, it's a pretty big statement to make 10 years later and you're not getting the full opportunity for a position because you've let your frustrations out on someone. So it's just kind of a heads up. Always smile and nod. You can be cranky with me after you hang up the phone. Trust me. I get cranky when I hang up the phone. Um, but just you want to keep it as professional as possible because you never know who else I'm going to know or who else you're going to know. Um, I've referred, I've talked to people that I've interviewed and loved and just hadn't been able to hire onto positions with other organizations as well. It is a really small world, especially how many of you are from this area? Especially this area. Everyone, I like to joke in the hospital that if, uh, if I turn around, I'm going to bump into my cousin's husband's brother right behind me. It's, it's a very small town. Everyone knows everyone else. So do you have any questions on office etiquette before I, or into, uh, interview etiquette before I go on to office etiquette? I thought it would be fun to share with you some of the things that, uh, that have happened to me over the past. Um, some of the things that we've seen, and as a recruiter, we have seen it all. I've had people bring their boyfriends to their interview, and they were so nervous, they um, got very romantic in our waiting area. We've had people's moms call to find out why they didn't get the job. Other things, um, I, <laughs> risque clothing is always a no-no. I've had people show up and see through clothing. Um, I did find that more prevalent when I worked at the police department than when I did um, at the hospital. Um, what else? People have spit food at me during lunch interviews. Oh, not intentionally, just the ginormous piece of rice come flying out of your mouth while you're answering a question. That's mortifying for everyone involved. Uh, I get hugged a lot. I get hugged a lot. Um, I am not a big hugger. In fact, hugging makes me kind of uncomfortable. So to be hugged by a candidate is always a little odd. odd. So what kind of questions do you have about interviewing? You don't have any questions at all? All right. At the end of the day, again, please know, we want to work with someone who makes us comfortable, who's pleasant to be around. If we're going to spend 40 hours a week with you, we want to like you. And so ultimately, you want your personality to show, but you want it to be the best part of your personality. Does that make sense? And again, you're not going to get everything 100% right. There's a, a professor that I used to have here, actually, <laughs> Dr. O'Hara, John O'Hara, uh, and he had two things that he always uh, felt very strongly about. And the first one, and I may even be failing this miserably today, is that he said whenever he interviewed someone, he worked on Madison Avenue. That, that, I always feel like it was Madison Avenue. He worked out in advertising for a long time. And he would interview someone, and when they left the room, he would check the back of their shoes. If the back of their shoes were scuffed, no job for them. Why? Because it showed lack of attention to detail. That was his thing. He also had the thing uh, that I am totally feeling miserably. He said, never drink soda at a meeting out of a can or a bottle. If there's not a glass available, you do not drink while you're there. Those were his things. Those were his tests. And everybody has their own thing. So it's, you're never going to be perfect and you can't stress out being perfect and letting it 
overwhelm you. You just want to, like I said, you just want to present the best part of who you are. So we'll talk about office etiquette. And I picked, chose this cartoon because uh, you don't want to be this person. And so uh, I felt office etiquette was the one area where I didn't, you know, I worked in offices since I graduated from college. And I know what kind of annoyed me, but I wanted to get some feedback from my friends and my associates and my coworkers about what really gets them going um, and what makes a good office mate. And there was a lot of talk about respect and cubicle land. This is cubicle land. Now, I used to sit in cubicle land, and uh, it's hard. If you sit in a lot of cubicles, you get to know your neighbors really well, uh, but you don't ever want to be this person where you've got the personal talker in the back and the too much information in the front. But for respect of time, for self and others. I'd say one of the things that irritates people most of all is being late. How many of you are, are, have a natural inclination to be running five to ten minutes late for everything? That is so me, especially once I had children. Uh, it's a real struggle for me to get where I need to be. But it's also one of my pet peeves. I am that person that have left my friends because they were ten minutes late. Sorry, you didn't make it. You can meet us inside. Um, this is a huge thing for the office. If you're going to be late to work, just give a call. You're going to think that no one notices when you sneak in 10 minutes late. They do. Um, it's just really the most appropriate thing to do is give people a call, give them a heads up, let them know you're going to be late, and always arrive to meetings five, five minutes early so you people can get started on time, so you can end on time. Works out better for everyone. I used to have a boss who used to lock people out of, out of meetings. If you arrived one minute late, the door would be locked. You'd miss out on whatever happened in that meeting. Well, sometimes that was a good thing. It's a harsh thing. And you only... Oh, do they really? Oh, good thing no one did that to me when I was here. So others, respect for others. Once you've been in the office setting for a while, you'll see there's always that one person. Never seems to have any work. They hang out, they go from office to office throughout the day, chatting it up, socializing. That is very frustrating as of someone who works with one. It's hard. You want to be nice, you want to be friendly with your coworkers. I think the most important thing to remember, sometimes that office is going to feel like home. <coughs> there are times where you're going to spend more time at the office than at home, but it's not your home. And you don't want to be so comfortable there that you think it is. You are there for a purpose, you get paid. You'll probably get paid pretty well, considering the amazing education you're getting here at Plattsburgh. And you just want to make sure that you're earning, you're being thoughtful with your employer's daughter, daughter. Yeah, with your employer's daughter as well. Um, dollar at every opportunity. All right, this was probably the biggest talked about topic amongst everyone. So I'm going to share something with you. I was probably 23 at the time. I was working for a temporary staffing agency in Albany, New York. And what that meant is that I had probably 35 people who worked under, um, as part of my group. I didn't know them very well. They worked at a different site. I had a group that was doing data entry, and they were all doing this data entry in a big room together. I had to have a conversation with a gentleman about his flatulence problem. Over the phone, I wanted to crawl in a hole. I don't know who was more mortified, him or I to discuss for, oh, five, ten minutes about his passing gas in the office and how inappropriate it was in a large group setting and how he could handle to rectify it. No HR person wants to have that conversation ever. Yeah, it's, it's, it, was, it was terrible. My boss at the time thought it was a great learning opportunity for me and sat there and laughed the entire time I had to have the conversation because I was bright red. I still get a little red thinking about that horrendous conversation, and it was 13 years ago. So good personal hygiene is always important. Practice it. At home seems to be key here. I am shocked and appalled at the number of people who told me that people clip their fingernails and toenails in the office. Really? This is the choice? Um, so it does happen. So just be cognizant. Keep a stick of deodorant in the office if you want. Shut the office door, whatever. Practice good personal hygiene and do it at home. <laughs> Can you imagine? I know, I can't even imagine. 
So discretion and TMI. So this is something I've learned a little bit more of since I've been in the workforce. Uh, so we all have this, again, when you're just moving out, if you're moving to a new city, you're not going to know a lot of people. A lot of the friends you're going to make are going to be through the office. Do you want to be known when you're up for that big promotion as the really smart guy who can really get the job done? Or do you want to be the guy that does really great keg stands who happens to be smart too? Which one do you want to be known by in the office? Anyone? The first one, right. You may be the best dancer, you may be the best, you may be able to stay up all night long, party like a rock star, show up at 8 o'clock the next morning, but that's not the impression that you want to you wanna leave with your employer. So when at all possible, leave your personal life at home, work life at work, and it works that much better for you in the long run. And TMI. So again, I have small children. I could talk about them all day long. And when you're a new mom, everything about that kid is fascinating. From the boogers, to the diapers, to the cute thing that Susie did while she was, I don't know, eating peanut butter. Not everyone wants to hear it. I know, it's shocking. Just like no one wants to, not everyone wants to hear about the great party you went to the night before. So it takes a, it does, it's a learning experience. But you'll, as you'll come along, you'll figure it out. Emotions. Uh, I also like to refer to this as what's love got to do with it? Um, the office, I'm a crier. I'll self-disclose. I have a tendency when I'm mad or frustrated to cry. I'd encourage you to not do that at the office. Um, to also not date in the office, if at all possible. That's another emotion that can really get in the way. It makes everyone around you uncomfortable. Do you need me to go for any further into that? We can also go, well, let's touch on anger a little bit too. Um, I can get more frustrated at work than I, than I can in most places. And while your immediate uh, reaction might be to just jump in and say something and react to the wrong that was done to you, I always encourage everyone, take a little bit of a walk, take a breather, go get a Diet Coke, go relax, and then come back with a clear head, maybe even wait till the next day and respond to that email or have that conversation. It's better to underreact than overreact to a situation. And often you'll, you'll hit that send button when you really should pick up the phone and have a conversation. Or and you'll regret it the next day. You'll wish you had said something a little different. Just a little tip. Any questions on that? Office etiquette. Some general topics. So office equipment, simple things like share. Um, don't take things off of people's desks. Common sense things that I think most of you have picked up living in the dorm life. Um, food, this was the other big thing that I never expected to hear so much feedback from. Um, food, never microwave seafood in an office. <laughs> Again, who would have thought? Um, I personally have a gag reflex to tuna fish, can't stand it. Uh, so you just want to be cognizant of those around you. Working in the hospital, we always say we have some great food and we are very fortunate to have some amazing cooks and a cafeteria on site. You just want to be really cognizant of the people around you. Um, if you li or work in a cubicle setting, it might, you might just want to go to a break room or a cafeteria to eat just so you're not um, overwhelming everyone with the smell of the burger and fries that you just picked up at lunchtime. Music as well. I work better with music. Do you guys work better with music? Listen to music while you're studying? Well, I am left fortunate enough to have a private office because not everyone truly enjoys country music. Anyone else here enjoy country music? Yeah, oh, so we got a couple. Usually it's just me in the room. It's nice to see. Um, so I can shut my office door when I need to have music. But again, if you're working in cubicle land, headphones are always a great choice or keep it really, really, really low. Just when you think it's low enough, turn it down one half notch more, and that way you won't um, you won't aggravate your coworkers. And personal calls. How many? Again, I know all of you have a cell phone, right? I think all of you raised your hand. When you're working in the office setting, keep it to an absolute minimum. Um, I again bring my cell phone with me everywhere, but it's part of my job. But I really only answer it if it has daycare flashing across the top, because it means I probably have a sick kid. Um, but no one likes everyone, the personal calls all day. I have a friend who was telling me, and this is also a friend actually, one of them who has a coworker that clips his toenails at the office, but she has a, a woman who works near her cubicle who has a 25-year-old son that she talks to him in baby talk every day when she calls to wake him up. 
I don't think your coworkers need that much information about you, right? So cubicles, they're a sensitive place. It's, it's, like, having, it's like having a roommate. You just want to use the same amount of courtesy. So what kind of questions do you guys have for me overall? I'm sure that you have questions. So quiet. You guys feel totally comfortable you're going to go out there in the world and do OK? Yeah, I think if you, if, oh, go ahead. Um, let's, say, <laughs> so, <laughs> let's say you do have that person who uh, listens to loud music or cuts their toenails or does things that's not etiquette for office. Um, how exactly do you approach this person? Or do you even approach the person all the boss? Like, or how do you go about telling them or letting them know if you're not like a so if it's, if it's not impacting you directly, I or impacting your customers directly, I would generally say, let it go. With the clipping the toenails in public, it's frustrating, it's not really fun, kind of gross, but if they're doing it in their cubicle and it's just kind of a, oh my goodness, type of thing, if it's something that truly is impacting you, I'm a big fan of address it with the individual yourself and in the most polite ways possible. I would avoid talking to the, your supervisor about it, if at all possible. It's, you know, usually it can be handled. Usually people don't even know. We had someone who left their socks on the radiator. I live in Vermont. It's winter, everyone wears socks, but if I'm having candidates come in, I don't want to see your socks on the radiator. Um, so it's just a, you know, a casual, hey, can we keep these, you know, out of sight for a little bit? We've got some candidates coming in. Someone would be like, oh, oh my goodness. Of course, absolutely. Most people aren't even cognizant of what they're doing. Again, you spend, these are people that you're going to spend 40, at least 40 hours a week with. Sometimes people just forget that it's not really home. What else? Hi. Can you talk about, uh, have you ever had to have a, a talk with an employee who was not dressing appropriately after you hired them? Absolutely. Unfortunately, I frequently have to have that conversation. So I work in a hospital. Uh, we have some pretty strict guidelines about what people can wear, what they can't wear, no um, piercings anywhere than the ears. Um, and when I have, again, these conversations make me as uncomfortable, probably more uncomfortable than they make the individual. And it's a very, um, you know, I think you've got great style, Jane. I love the fact um, that you have such individualistic style. Here, we're a little more conservative, and I'm actually looking to see a little bit, I'm trying to think of a better way to say that. Um, I like to see a little bit more coverage. Um, we have had individuals who, the short skirts, um, yeah, the really low-cut tank tops in the, in the summertime. But in patient care areas, we wouldn't want any kind of uh, mishap. We, wouldn't, we want to make sure we're presenting ourselves in the best possible light to our patients at all times. Um, when in doubt, I say cover up more. You know, there's very few organizations. In our organizations, there's their hosiery rules. If you work in patient care, you cannot have any open-toed shoes. Um, Flip-flops are never OK in our organization either. And again, something you'll kind of learn You'll want to make sure you pay attention to it as it comes in, because we do definitely um, make our judgments by people, what we see them in when they first come up. I, it doesn't matter how expensive. I, I, you know, I don't want to give the impression. It's not the expensive suit that I want to see you showing up in. I want to see you in something neat and clean and well-pressed, something that's showing that you're paying good attention to what you're doing and that you care about your appearance, um, that you're there not to be a distraction, but to be a, an addition to our team. Does that sound fair? Another question for you. Sure. Um, if, uh, can you think of any political mistakes that are common in the office? Political. Mm -hmm. We say political like. So they're, they're not rules. They're not written rules that people are breaking, but there are rules that can affect their standing in the office and the organization. Yes, and it, a lot of it depends on the culture of the organization. I once worked for an organization. It was, in some ways, it was the hardest job I ever had. I could call it the worst job in some ways. Um, it was definitely difficult, but I learned more in that, org in that role than I have ever learned in any other role. And you'll want to pay attention to what's going on around you. In that organization, if you left before 6 o'clock in the evening, uh, you were a slacker. It didn't matter if you were logging on from home and working all hours of the night from home. If you weren't putting in the FaceTime, 
you weren't considered to be a strong employee and wouldn't move up. Um, in our current organization, there's a real frowning on, on uh, gossiping. I know it's always exciting to see what else is going on, but you always want to be very cognizant of who you're speaking to and what you're speaking about. As I mentioned earlier, especially, in the, I've never noticed it so much as I have at the organization I'm currently with. We have entire families that work for the hospital. We're the largest private employer in the state. Um, and so gossiping really gets, is a negative and gets picked up on. And if you're perceived as someone who chatters about other people a lot, it definitely makes an impact on your, on your um, career. You may be the smartest, brightest person on the planet, but if you're seen as a potster or someone who's not supportive of your teammates, um, it has a real impact on, on how far you can go in an organization. Did I scare you again? Again, it's you really want people around you to be comfortable and think highly of you. In an organization you walk in, you want someone to see you. They want you, to, you want to be remembered as that smart person that gets things done not the really fun guy who would stay out, stay out all night or party or someone who, you know, they're at the water cooler all day. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the go-to person that really is successful. Uh, I have my business card up here. If you guys have questions, you're more than welcome to email me or give me a call. Um, and if you have questions, I'll hang out for a couple of minutes, okay? Thank Thanks, you. guys. <laughs> oh, it's nice.